what I would like to talk about today is um, algorithms for isogeny problems, both classical and quantum. And the motivation here is uh, from post-quantum cryptography. So the goal in post-quantum crypto is to develop um, public key algorithms that are secure even when uh, quantum computers are built. And uh, while it's easy to list what the bad choices are, um, basically everything we're currently using in cryptography is bad because it can be broken by quantum algorithms. So RSA is one such choice that is not secure against um, quantum. And uh, traditional elliptic curve cryptography is also not secure. Um, and so then it, the big question is, what would be the good choices? And uh, that is still a big question mark. Um, some proposals are lattice-based systems. So the main ones are like learning with errors, LWE, or a ring version of the same problem. Um, there is also um, uh, another type of um, system, like code-based system. Um, Michaelis is an example of that. And then there are systems based on isogenies. And that is what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about whether isogeny-based crypto is a good candidate for post-quantum crypto and sort of um, say what some of the different equivalent problems are that um, these systems are based on and what can be done with quantum algorithms or maybe even classical algorithms already for these uh, underlying hardness assumptions. So um, traditionally, um, elliptic curve for use in cryptography was first introduced in 1985 uh, and has sort of been wild, widely used I want to say maybe 2004, 2005. Um, and it's based on the hardness of the discrete log problem on elliptic curves. Now, uh, Shor's algorithm for the discrete log problem gives a polynomial time algorithm for computing discrete logs. So that means uh, uh, these systems are not secure against quantum. And um, so one question is, can one still use elliptic curves? And uh, so in the traditional way, we had one elliptic curve. Um, the points on this elliptic curves are solution of an equation. It always looks like this, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where the little a and the little b are in some finite field and the x and y we're treating as the variable. So we're looking for solutions to these um, curves. And sort of the, the, the only thing that sort of matters for um, the talk today is that the points on this curve together with some um, point at infinity that these form an abelian group. So we have some abelian group. That's why we can define a discrete log problem on it. And um, uh, so, so this is always the way we can think about um, elliptic curves when that word comes up in the talk. Just It's just so, um, points on the curve are just solutions to these equations. Um, and uh, OK, so now what changes? Um, how can we make something that's maybe still uh, good in the post-quantum setting? So again, sort of to um, um, put the two against each other. So we have the traditional way of doing it where we have one particular elliptic curve that we're working with. And then we're using the group law on this curve. And uh, so that's no longer a good option. So what is the new idea? 
um, well, it says isogeny based. So that means um, it's not just elliptic curves, but this time we're going to look at not just one curve, but an exponentially large set of elliptic curves. And we're gonna look at the maps between them. And um, so throughout my talk, I'm gonna use the terminology super singular to make sure that the statements I'm making are correct. But the actual notion of what it means for an elliptic curve to be super singular, we won't need that until like the very end. So for right now, it's fine to just think about elliptic curve. And also um, when I say isogeny, um, it's fine to just think about just maps between elliptic curves. They have some extra properties in terms of what they, um, that they preserve the group structure and so forth, but it's fine to just think of, so we have curves, with some extra property that's called super singular. And then we have maps between them, which are called isogenies. And so why would we even wanna do this? Um, well, um, when you go back to the first slide that I um, had where I talked about post-quantum crypto, I listed a few proposals, namely I listed lattice-based ones, I listed Michaelis as like an example of a code-based one, and then I mentioned isogeny-based systems, and that's pretty much it. So the pool of uh, potential post-quantum con candidates is not big. So we really need to look at all of them and figure out if they're a viable uh, option as a replacement for things like RSA and ECC that are currently being used. And that's exactly what NIST is currently doing in its uh, uh, attempt to make a new standard that's supposed to standardize a new post-quantum secure system. Um, and they've been looking at various proposals, isogeny-based systems, one of them. And um, okay, so there are very few. And also because elliptic curves have already been used in a different way in cryptography for a pretty long time. We have a lot of experience with them. There's a lot of infrastructure in terms of code that's been written. And so it would be nice if we can keep all of that. And um, also some of the problems that will come up later like the endomorphism ring problem, those have already been looked at by some computational number theorists. So, um, uh, so these problems have been studied quite a bit. Um, and we have some confidence, um, at, so at least uh, gives more confidence that this might be a hard problem if it's been studied um, before. And uh, of course, there are also concerns. Um, a big one is that the systems have really not been sufficiently scrutinized by people who work in quantum algorithms. And so this workshop is a great opportunity to get more exposure and to at least get out there what the problems are that should be hard. Um, and uh, a second concern is that sort of um, the, the main, so um, maybe the mainstream replacements that are being proposed as post-quantum secure are a lattice-based system. And um, the, one of the reasons is that they have, um, that you can do things like fully homomorphic encryption with them. You can do things like identity-based encryption with them. And so these functionalities are not there for the um, um, isogeny-based systems that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so um, that's certainly a drawback, um, but uh, what, what, at least we wanna see how secure the things that we can do, key exchange, signature, how, how secure um, 
hash function, how um, secure these are believed to be. And so I'm sort of, here's a table with like a bunch of different systems and the underlying hard problem that these are based on. So we have RSA with factoring, ECC with discrete logs. So those are both out now in the post-quantum world. Then we have LWE and ring LWE based on the hardness of finding short vectors in lattices. Um, there are the super singular guys and um, there is a system, I'm just sort of putting it out. Soliloquy was another system based on lattices what that was proposed um, that had a different hardness assumption. And that was actually one that could be broken um, by a quantum algorithm um, for the unit group. So, so that means the, so the first, the second and the last entry in this, uh, and, and these systems are not secure against quantum. And the uh, ring LWE or LWE and the isogen based ones um, we're, we're investigating still. So, okay, so what happens in isogeny based systems? So, what kind of stuff do we have? Just to sort of give a little bit of a timeline, um, a hash function was proposed in 2006. Then, there was a system based on ordinary curves, also in 2006, but that was really not efficient enough. Um, then nothing happened for a while until sort of the uh, system was proposed that we're calling, when we're just referring to super singular isogeny systems that a lot of people have in mind, the um, system by David Zhao and uh, Luca de Feo um, um, called SIDH for super singular isogeny Diffie Hellman. So that was proposed in 2011. And since then, sort of various more systems have come up. And um, one sort of thinks of um, the systems in like two categories the quote unquote non commutative ones um, and the ones that come with a group action. Um, I should say that. The thing that's non-commutative, it's not the group itself. The points on the elliptic curve always form a commutative group, an abelian group. The thing that would, is non-commutative here is uh, an object called the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve. But uh, so, so, so in particular, if you look at the dates, you can sort of see that since 2011, then have, there have sort of been proposals 2018, 19, 20, 21, and these are all sort of slightly different proposals. It's not building all on the same problem. They're all slightly different proposals. So these are like very newly proposed systems. And so um, just because they are so new, they have not really been um, studied in much detail. So what is the status of everything? Um, well, partly because of the reasons that I mentioned before, the isogeny-based systems have received much less attention than the lattice-based ones. And so we need a lot more research um, to develop confidence in these systems, both classically and against quantum computers. So I. To, to probably too early to just say something. And um, so the objects need to be studied, the hardness assumptions. And one key thing is that the hardness assumptions can be phrased in many different ways, spanning different areas, which I will um, come to in a few minutes. And um, also a lot of the objects that show up um, don't really have canonical small representatives. So I was just gonna say that at least in terms of understanding the objects, we can at least show that all the objects involved have polynomial representation size, because if you can't even show that, then you certainly can't given, show that there is an attack that works in polynomial time if you can't even write your objects 
all down in um, polynomial time. Um, and we're also um, we're able to, uh, again, um, work by myself and Holgren, Lauder, Morrison, and Petit. We're able to give some reductions between different hardness assumptions and um, the heuristics we needed to use. Um, um, Benjamin Veselovsky was recently able to resolve a lot of these. Um, and so, even though everything sounds um, like all these objects are sort of things from algebraic geometry, um, the way they are analyzed are through uh, the graph that's associated to these problems. And so I'll, I'll show a picture on the next slide. Um, and the main point is that we have an exponential size graph called the L isogeny graph. And um, the graph is an expander, which means that um, after a certain number of steps you take, you have nice mix mixing properties and, um, um, and which you can use to analyze um, certain properties. And um, the curves that we care about have all have small representation size, the curves do. But the maps between them can generally be defined over some large fields, which we would need to avoid because we don't want things to blow up. And um, also, in order to be secure, the maps that we have to use in the crypto system will be ex exponential size object. And so that means um, we need to use the fact that those can be decomposed into smaller ones that we can write down. So, okay, so what is this isogeny graph? So here is a picture of, the, of an isogeny graph. Um, and uh, so, so the subscript here is the L. There's no P because P is fixed throughout. That's just the characteristic of the finite field we're working with. And then we're picking another prime L, like let's say um, L equals three. And um, uh, the graph will have roughly P over 12 vertices, will be an expander graph. And the other, so that means because of the size of the graph, we can't write down, say, it's a JSONC matrix. But one thing we can do is if you give me a vertex, with, um, I can efficiently compute the neighbors. So what is the definition? So and it, the whole thing will be related to isogenies will be the pathfinding problem. So, so we have this graph GL. The vertices are super singular elliptic curves. So there are P over 12 of them in characteristic P, roughly. And edges in the graph are given by maps between the curves of degree L. And a map of degree L just means that it's a, it's a map whose kernel has size L. So this will be a group homomorphism whose kernel has um, size L. And so from a computational standpoint, if, for example, I let L be two, so I'm looking at isogenies of degree two, then I get a picture that looks like the one I have on the board right now. And for like a given starting point E, I could compute all the neighbors of that elliptic curve Namely, I could compute E1, E2, and E3. So that's an easy problem. On the other hand, if you just give me some other curve E prime, that's the one on the very right there, and you just say, now find a bunch of compositions of maps that give a path from E to E prime, that is a hard problem, believed to be a hard problem. And um, so, uh, so that is um, what we're going to be looking at. 
So namely, that will be our hardness assumption. And so in the background, now before I have any of my other information on the slide up, you can sort of see an example from um, of a super singular graph. Um, I think it's like with a four digit prime or something. So it, uh, that's the picture of what the graph would look like. And, and we're trying to connect two vertices. So namely the hardness assumption that uh, the crypto systems are based on are that there is no efficient algorithm to solve the following problem. If I give you two curves, E and E prime, like I had on the previous picture, um, it, we're saying, we're um, conjecturing that there is no efficient algorithm to find a path from the first starting curve E to the curve E prime in this L isogeny graph. And for theoretical reasons, so we do know that um, graph is connected, so we know there is a path, um, but the problem is um, finding one or, and, or giving an efficient algorithm for finding a path. And again, here, the problem is interesting because P is the object, the prime that has cryptographic size, so several hundred digits. L is something like two or three. Um, our input parameters would be the curves E and E prime here. And so th that means the input size is just log P. And so now, so, so this sort of sets up what, so what is the fastest classical algorithm for constructing isogeny? like for now even not specifying the degree, that can be done in O tilde of P and a half, um, square root P. Um, so the tilde just means that there are some log factors hiding somewhere that I'm not writing down. That's work of Delfs and Galbraith. Um, what does quantum, can quantum do any better? Well, um, there is a way uh, there is a quantum algorithm by Bias Jao Sankar that uh, reads, achieves a square root speed up. And the square root speed up comes from using Grover's algorithm to first to take your starting curve E and first find a path defined to another curve that's defined over a smaller field and then work from there. Um, and uh, but so. Um, both algorithms are still exponential, but the quantum algorithm has an improvement over the best classical one. Um, how about other problems besides problems from graph theory? Well, you can actually show that pathfinding is equivalent to several other problems. It is equivalent to computing endomorphism rings and also to computing maximal orders in quaternion algebras. So, um, so let me just define here what an endomorphism is. So an endomorphism, it's just a map from the elliptic curve E to itself. Um, these maps, um, they form a ring. And that's the object we call the endomorphism ring. Um, it's also a lattice. And so this is sort of where the super singular stuff kicks in. Um, if the curve is super singular, the lattice, which is forms with the endomorphism ring as a lattice has rank four. If it's not super singular, it only has rank two. And, uh, and this is sort of where we also get a separation of how hard the problem is. For non-super singular elliptic curves, the endomorphism ring problem, at least as we understand it now, is simpler than in the super singular case. So this is sort of, so endomorphism ring is big, it has rank four. Um, and so here is the endomorphism ring problem. We have a prime P that's fixed and su two su uh, in a super singular elliptic curve with coefficients in FP squared, that can always be done. We wanna find four endomorphisms that generate the endomorphism ring as a lattice. That is the endomorphism ring problem. So I wanna write down four maps 
which as a lattice generate the whole thing. And um, so in 2018, um, together with Holgren, um, Lauder, Morrison, and Petit, we show, I showed that um, under GIH and some other heuristics, um, this pathfinding problem and the endomorphism ring problem are equivalent. And Vesolovsky um, improved that by removing some of the heuristic assumptions. Uh, GIH, the generalized Riemann hypothesis is still there. Um, but so what does that mean? So it means now in like in, as a picture, so if we start with our super singular key exchange and our hash function say, um, we can read that reduce their security reduces to pathfinding. That's a graph theoretic problem. Then we have an endomorphism ring problem that's equivalent to pathfinding. So I think of that as a problem from arithmetic, sort of meaning it has algebraic flavor and geometric flavor because you're using the fact that the things that show up here, these points on the curve that they form a group, but you're also writing down maps, which is a geometric object. Um, the other object that I am not gonna have time to um, explain are certain quaternion algebras. Um, uh, orders in quaternion algebras that show up here. Um, that's also an equivalent problem. I would think that's sort of squarely on the algebraic side. There's no geometric information there, really. And then there's also pathfinding in quaternion algebras. So there are related problems, but the reduction is not always efficient. And so we can't go back and forth there. Um, and we, lastly, it can also be related to pathfinding and quotients of bruja tree, which boils down to a lot of linear algebra in uh, two by two matrices with coefficients in ZL. And so um, that is sort of my only slide that has the word linear algebra on it. So I'm, I have it with, uh, in boldface here. Um, and it's kind of funny because um, when you say Buratit's trace to mathematicians, that's usually um, connected to like Shimura curves and people uh, are sort of scared by these kind of objects. But in sort of um, once you write down what's going on and sort of express it in terms of linear algebra, these are actually things that are really nice to compute with. So, um, but again, um, there is a connection. It's not always efficient to go back and forth between these uh, paths in these um, tits trees and uh, the paths in the isogeny graph. Um, okay, so there is another thing I want to, a set of schemes I want to mention, namely ones that have more structure um, via uh, a group action. So we have the same graph as before, or like the same style of graph, but now we have that we can go from one Turtex to the next via group action. So, and typically these um, sets of vertices that we're looking at, they're fewer, but still exponential size. So for example, we might take every, all the curves with coefficients in the ground field and then pick out the ones that are super singular ones that's sort of square root, will get square root P rather than P. And um, in these systems, there's also a group action, some abelian groups, that's why they're called commutative isogeny schemes. The, there's some group um, that acts on this set of curves. And in order for this to make a good crypto system, we want the group action to be we want to be able to compute that action efficiently so that we can go from one vertex to the next. And we want the action to be hard to invert so that we can't go back. And in fact, the security of the scheme depends on how hard the group act is, uh, action is to invert. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because for these schemes, um, 
quantum algorithms are able to break this in sub-exponential time. And so Child, Zhao, and Sukarev were the first ones to see this. Um, they showed in 2014 that in order to, they proved that um, if you want to invert this group action, um, you can instead solve an abelian hidden shift problem. And then this was extended to more cases by Vesolovsky in 21. And then once you have it reduced to a um, abelian hidden shift problem for, for a finite group still, then you can use Kuberberg's sub-exponential time algorithm for the abelian hidden shift problem, which is um, also which is in his paper for the dihedral hidden subgroup problem. And um, so you get a sub-exponential algorithm to solve the hardness assumption in the setting and to break the system. So that means these isogeny-based guys that come with a group action reduced to the abelian hidden shift problem and just sort of uh, to recall, so in the abelian hidden shift problem, the setup is that we have two functions that are uh, differ by a shift S. Um, everything's written multiplicatively here, even though the group G is, is abelian and the goal is to find this shift. So, okay, so now it looks like we have two isogeny based type things um, and that they're sort of, uh, one has more structure than the other, but it turns out that the more we understand these newer systems, we sort of see that uh, this um, framework with uh, a group action can be extended to more cases. And um, so if you wanted to just like solve one single problem, is there one that we, uh, that one should break that would sort of break every single uh, proposed scheme? And yes, there is, it's the anamorphism ring problem. Um, so the way I had presented it, um, it, it, I didn't really have time to go in the details, but um, the original proof that related endomorphism rings to isogeny finding um, really only um, did not um, immediately apply to the uh, schemes that had also the group action. But uh, that has recently been extended. And so that means now the picture looks like this. We have the key exchange, the hash function reducing to path finding. And that is equivalent to finding endomorphism rings. Then we have the systems based on group actions that can be reduced to abelian hidden shift, but now it also reduces to endomorphism rings. So that, um, so everything sort of converges to the endomorphism ring problem. And that's also actually the pro I'm really happy about that because that is one of the problems I find the most interesting because it has this, it has sort of graph theory stuff, geometric flavor and algebraic flavor. So I like that a lot. And so the question then is, so this is my conclusion. Um, well, if everything can be broken, if you have a good algorithm for uh, efficient algorithm for computing um, anamorphism rings, how fast can you do this? And in a paper with, together with Holgren, um, <clears throat> uh, Leonardi, uh, Morrison, and Park, we were able to show that uh, the fastest, or this is the fastest algorithm, but it's still fully exponential. The bottleneck in this algorithm is that we still, in order to get some elements in the uh, endomorphism ring to begin with, we need to find a cycle in the isogeny graph that passes through E. And so far, um, it's not clear if quantum can do better here. And it's that that would be like a big quest, that would be like a big thing showing 
whether quantum algorithms can get some kind of speed up. So let me just um, uh, summarize here what I've talked about. So I've talked about super singular isogeny based crypto as a candidate for post quantum um, crypto schemes. And um, we saw that some of the proposed schemes have uh, can be reduced to the billion hidden shift problem. And so there is at least a sub exponential time algorithm. Um, an efficient quantum algorithm for computing anamorphism rings would break all the proposed systems. Um, but so far, everything is exponential and it's not clear how quantum algorithms could get an advantage. And so that would be the open problem that I want to close with. Um, it would already be a big deal if you could find a sub-exponential algorithm for computing super singular anamorphism rings. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you.